Okay, so today we're going to talk about cyclosporin, primarily in dermatology. Uh, I say that because it's used, obviously, in um, transplant patients, rheumatology, etc. We use much lower dosages in general. Um, and cyclosporin essentially is an immunosuppressant, as we know, and it's a, bro a pro drug that basically once it enters into T cells and binds to its um, ligand, it, it, it activates itself and actually has its function. Now, the pill in itself, not the pill, but the actual drug that's sold comes in two forms. Um, a modified form, which was originally distributed, I'm sorry, non-modified, and then essentially a modified form that was a microemulsion in an aqueous environment and actually is a lipophilic. lipophilic. Um, they come in similar tablets, as you can see, Sandimmune and Sisse, the non-modified generic. They come in tablets as well as an IV form. The modified form, which is the one we use more commonly, Neoral um, or Cyclosporin modified or Gengraf, similar type tablets, 25-100, 25-100. You'll see it's always the same. Same with the IV dosages because the dosages, it doesn't matter what you're giving. The difference is subtle. I'll talk about that briefly in the uh, further discussion. The modified version, which is the one we tend to use more often, has a higher viability um, and the dosing is one to one. So nearly identical, so like 10 percent difference, one to 1.1. 1 1. Um, the modified version is uh, absorbed more consistently and initially cyclosporin was developed, um, actually isolated from a fungus, hoping that it would be an antibiotic. Um, however, it was, find, it was found to have immunosuppressive effects in 1976, and, um, and they further noticed that when they did any further studies in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis, essentially patients that had psoriatic arthritis and were receiving the drug and they had lesions were resolved. That's how they figured that out back in the 79. This is the complex chemical structure. It's basically made up of 11 amino acids. I think it's, if you guys memorize that, you can write that down, be awesome. Um, <laughs> so it get, this lecture gets a little dry. We'll have some clinical photographs, I apologize. Most of these drug lectures are relatively dry. Um, although, you know, uh, cyclosporin affects T cells in various ways, as well as other cells, fibroblasts and stuff, the, the most commonly studied or most uh, most developed understanding is that in the calmodulin complex pathway. Um, basically, can you guys, you can see, um, you can see my um, arrow, right? You'll see here cyclosporin is here. Let's just forget about cyclosporin. FK506 is tecrolimus or prograph. Same compound that's in uh, protopic. Um, but anyway, these drugs, they bind to immunofillins. These immunofillins without the, the drug actually bind to calmodulin complexes and actually dephosphorylate nuclear factor activated T cell. This dephosphorylated nuclear factor activated T cell actually translocates into the nucleus of the T cell promotes transcription of various interleukins, including two, but also 14, 17, and 22, which we now know 17 and 22 are predominant pathways and the major pathways in the development of psoriasis. Now, cyclosporin actually has an extremely high affinity for its immunophilin, binds to the immunophilin, as you can see here, cyclophilin, cyclosporin complex, and this actually raises the affinity of this immunophilin to calmodulin. Once it binds to calmodulin, it inhibits the dephosphorylation of nuclear factor activated T cell, which then cannot translocate into the um, into the nucleus and subsequent transcription of certain genes that we require for inflammation and immune response to occur. So that's essentially that in a nutshell. However, we do know that in addition to this well-known pathway, cyclosporin has effects both in the TGF-beta pathway as well as certain MAP kinase pathways to stimulate the, um, the transcription of other genes involved in the inflammatory process. Now, that said, 
that said the scientific pathway, right? Um, more importantly, what you'll need to know based on what drugs, what why you're going to use this drug and, and what ailments that we use them in dermatology. We know now, right, it targets primarily T helper cells. However, it does also inhibit T suppressor cells. It depletes lymphocytes and macrophages in the epidermis and dermis. And that here is because it downregulates ICAM, which is very important in the diapodesis of T cells into the skin from endothelial cells, from the vascular through the endothelial cells, I should say. Now, it also inhibits NK cells and antigen presenting cells, inhibits keratinocyte hyperproliferation, which obviously clearly would play a role in its um, function in psoriasis. Um, it uh, decreases TNF alpha and interleukin 17, 23, and 22, as we talked about. And these we now know are one of the main drugs uh, pathways, I'm sorry, um, in psoriasis development. And even we see more newer drugs that are actually in development should be out soon, targeting, some are already out, but there's a new one out coming, targeting these have passy 75 like 95 percent so this is incredible this is why this drug probably primarily works in psoriasis um inhibits the nitrogen nitric oxide synthase activation inhibits cell degranulation this is important for its utilization in in atopic dermatitis you could see here that um by decreasing histamine release by mast cells clearly that's involved in the uh, pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis and down regulates high affinity IgE receptors, which also is a factor or um, role in the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis and why this drug is so successful in treating that entity. Um, this just shows all the functions of T cells and what they do basically in all these some way or form cyclosporin is blocking it. A little irrelevant at this point after we went over that. Um, as far as the pharmacokinetics are um, concerned, the cyclosporine oral bioavailability is not determined. Um, it's poorly, um, the lipophilic is poorly absorbed or orally, and it requires bile salts for absorption. So we know that primary absorption is going to occur in the small intestine, probably duodenum, but uh, the upper portions of the, the small intestine. Um, peak absorption occurs two to four hours after dosing. Um, as we mentioned, the modified version is a hydrophilic microemulsion that's highly lipophilic, has a much higher bioavailability, um, less intra-individual fluctuation. Um, we see in patients with psoriasis, they have it's more rapid, higher remission rates at lower dosages. And um, you shouldn't use the drugs interchangeably as far as the different names. And you got to brand, use, you know, when you're writing the prescription for residents, use be brand specific as far as what you say on the uh, prescription. Again, like I had mentioned before, <clears throat> it's highly lipophilic, so it distributes widely. Once absorbed, it'll bind primarily to leukocytes, obviously red blood cells, lipoproteins, etc., but leukocytes are their main target. It's 90% bound to lipoproteins and higher serum concentrations um, of cyclosporin A are seen in patients um, that take it before receiving meals and once in, in and as a result we see higher clinical efficacy when taken prior to meals there's a 27 percent first pass effect in the liver so primary metabolization and elimination of this drug is through the liver um, and through bile so not the kidneys even though and i might go into this later even though um, this drug actually has major um, adverse effects um, to the kidneys both acute and chronic toxicities and actually understanding those acute and chronic toxicities understands why you have to um, decrease the drug with, or um, stop the drug, depending on what's going on with the, uh, the blood work. <clears throat> um, the bioavailability and clearance controlled by cytochrome P450 pathway, as we said, both you know present in the liver and small intestine where they're getting metabolized. Um, that Therefore, you have to keep an eye on drug interactions. Um, and I go into that later on, so you're aware of those, although those you have to memorize for your exams or for your future. 6% um, of it is excreted in urine as metabolites, 0% unchanged in urine. So even though there is an amount that goes through um, the urine, the vast, again, the vast majority is through metabolites in the liver and through bile. Um, 
the, the, the cyclosporin is dosed on a weight per weight basis. Um, and the drug in itself um, is, dr is dose dependent. Um, we recommend ideal body weight for dosaging. However, some guidelines in those obese patients were looking at um, actual body weight because the drug is so lipophilic. We don't get into those drug dosages above six milligrams per kg per day. Um, we're usually under five. So, you know, we're somewhere between two and five migs per kg per day. Um, so we don't, this doesn't have a major effect. However, some patients may not respond who are very obese, and that may be part of the reason. African Americans have a decreased absorption and lower bioavailability when compared to Caucasians due to polymorphins, polymorphisms in MDR1 and cytochrome P453A genes. Okay. So, <clears throat> again, this is another thing that's important is what is this drug FDA approved for in dermatology. And the only thing it's approved for is psoriasis, severe recalcitrant and disabling psoriasis. The rest of its utilization, including atopic dermatitis, is off label. Okay. So anything that's T cell related, you can use this drug, whether it's vasculitis, whether it's some immunobullous uh, disorders. Um, there are cases of patients treated with bad rosacea with cyclosporin, um, or at least topical cyclosporin, um, <clears throat> or chronic urticaria. Chronic urticaria is another one, or papillary urticaria, extensively used in that entity. So, and sometimes in connective tissue disorders, however, we just see such a great effect with CELSEP that we really haven't gone, we don't go to this route um, as commonly anymore. Um, there are absolute contraindications, and that is receiving live attenuated uh, vaccines, patients obviously who are not compliant, um, uncontrolled or severe hypertension, um, serious infections and immune compromise. Pregnancy and lactation are relative. This is, uh, is, is, is um, pregnancy C, level C. So uh, we talk about this before immunosuppressants and most of the talks I give um, how do you screen these patients and how do you follow them? Um, once you understand the side effects, you'll kind of understand why. Um, clearly, if you have immune suppression, some active viral or infection, it will be a contraindication to stop the drug. So the patient needs to be evaluated um, prior. Um, typically, we evaluate for tuberculosis, hep B and C, history of hypertension, kidney disease or liver disease, malignancies. Um, this drug definitely should not be given in association with concomitant systemic malignancies, especially like lymphoma. This is a bad one for patients receiving lymphoma. Uh, full medication history, and that's because um, there's a lot of interactions um, of this drug with other drugs. Blood pressure, this does affect blood pressure, not in all patients. It's not dose-dependent. Um, but the patient should, and I'll go into how I assess that, but they should have um, blood pressures 140, 90 or less, and it should be repeated. Um, <laughs> physical examination, this will can lead to reactivation of herpes lesions. The thing with actinic damage and cutaneous malignancies is that this raises the risk for the development for non-melanoma skin cancers. And as a result, it is something that needs to be discussed and the pros and cons should be measured prior to giving the patient. Serum creatinine, we measure that because of the acute toxicities in the kidney that are related to this disease. I'll talk about that in a minute. Blood urea nitrogen also, again, evaluating the, the uh, kidney function a CBC, potassium, bilirubin, and LFTs, fasting lipid profile, because we do know that this elevates triglycerides and sometimes cholesterol, uric acid, magnesium. We do see some patients developing hypomagnesemia, hypomagnesemia and why we, it's probably related to the kidneys as far as leakage. Urine analysis, TB, or quantifier on goal test should be performed initially and prior to receiving the drug, and then likely... Um, if they're recommending it in biologics once yearly, you should probably repeat it yearly with this subset of patient again. Um, clearly, these patients should be up to par with their screening for underlying malignancies and vaccinations. They should receive annual pneumococcal influenza vaccines, not any live vaccines. 
Um, this is just from the National Psoriasis Foundation and their recommendations on serologies for Hep B. Basically, patients who are candidates for TNF alpha or are going to receive any other biologic cyclosporin or methotrexate should receive, uh, they be evaluated ser serologically for um, hepatitis B surface antigen, surface antibody, and core antibodies. Okay. This is also recommended by the National Psoriasis Foundation where you have screening for patients with latent, for latent uh, TB infection prior to commencement. Um, and they, this is specifically from the article. They do, this paper was specifically written for biologic agents. However, in the article, they do add cyclosporin and methotrexate, same as the prior slide that we've just reviewed. <clears throat> um, you know, I think these things will change as well. Um, some of this stuff is, is based on committees and what they feel. Um, the evidence-based medicine evaluation and screening for many situations are always being tightened. So just in, in, in a little bit more, uh, more cost effective every day. So it's something you need to pay attention to. Those are the current recommendations at this time. Um, so I'm going to talk about dosing for psoriasis and atopic dermatitis um, because of those are the most two most common um, diseases we're dealing with. I'm not going to get into uh, everything else. However, we do use similar dosing patterns. Um, when we use cyclosporin for psoriasis, most typically, most commonly today and day, we're using it for rapid induction therapy in combination with another um, agent. Um, this drug is actually, uh, cyclosporin is safe um, in combination with biologics. So that's bridging therapy. The other area that it's used highly is in crisis interventions. Again, a patient with <clears throat> severe psoriasis, erythrodermic, or um, uh, acute uh, pustular psoriasis or von Zumbusch, that subset of patients because we want a rapid response. This drug acts extremely rapidly. Now, we don't Long-term continuous use for psoriasis and intermittent short dosages uh, courses is we're actually moving away from that, even though you can still use it. It's not contraindicated. It's just with what this new day and age of biological therapy, we just don't use it as much in that sense here in the United States. The initial dosing, again, remember it's on actual body race typically, is uh, two to six milligrams per kg per day, you just divide it twice daily. So common dosage is 200 milligrams uh, twice daily, for example, for a patient that's, you know, 70 kilos. Um, if they're failing response at a low dose after about a month, because remember this acts not like Celsep takes three, four months for you to really evaluate the dosage. This drug is very rapid. You may increase the dose from 0 0.5 to 1.0 milligrams per kg per day at two to four week intervals. Your maximum dosage shouldn't go beyond six, and the reason for that is because of the nephrotoxicity primarily, primarily. Um, if you're at a high dose, you have an inadequate response, after three months, you just discontinue the drug and try something else. Um, response uh, to the drug is dose-dependent, okay? Uh, we did mention that. However, not for the hypertension, just on a side note. Um, the, hyper, the hypertension is not dose dependent. Nephrotoxicity is dose dependent. Um, the response to the drug is dose dependent. Um, after improvement, uh, you can actually taper off until you get to a lower effective maintenance dose. Because, you know, even though we, we always say don't treat patients for more than a year or two um, with cyclosporin, there are patients on for years and years and years. The reason why we don't treat them for years um, ideally, right, is because of the chronic nephrotoxicity, primarily. Um, <clears throat> so we do try to keep them on this drug for a shorter period of time with the lower dosages over time. Palmar plantar psoriasis, we tend to start with higher dosages, just so you know, because they're a little bit more recalcitrant. And this is obviously a safe drug to use in pediatric populations. Um, the thing with pediatric population, especially with atopic, more so with atopic, no so much with psoriasis. Actually, I'll mention it later. I'll bring it up later. 
but it's effective in pediatric populations. This is actually a good case of a patient who was uh, admitted um, in clinic erythrodermic psoriasis. Um, we treated him initially with combination cyclosporin. He had nothing. He was just receiving topicals that got erythrodermic. We could see he has some edema as well. He uh, was treated a combination of cyclosporin and um, etanercept. Um, this was several months later. He was off cyclosporin. He was just on etanercept, the picture on the right. Um, however, the cyclosporin he was on for a month and a half, rapid clearance, rapid clearance. Then he was maintained um, with the, the etanercept after that. We discontinued the cyclosporin and the etanercept. Um, was kept on. So this is the bridging therapy we were talking about. This postular psoriasis, again, a patient came in. He was, <clears throat> actually is interesting. He was using about a pound of triamcinolone ointment daily. Um, and then he ran out. <laughs> he ran out and he came in and the poor gentleman developed pretty bad subacute postular psoriasis. Again, this patient also received um, cyclosporin initially on admission resolved um, pretty quickly. I don't remember how long he was discharged, but it wasn't long, a week or two. Um, and then uh, was discontinued off the cyclosporin, maintained on the etanercept, and you can see him on the bottom here. He was clear by a month follow-up after discharge. <clears throat> um this is atopic dermatitis. Now, atopic dermatitis, we start a little bit higher dosage, five mg per kg per day for two weeks, and we gradually taper until we get the actual clinical response with the lowest dosage that we, we need. Um, several studies, just a huge meta-analysis. This is just the summary of it. Um, the bottom line is the higher dosage that they were using, the more rapid the, the, the improvement over two weeks. You can see here the four to five mg per kg versus the two to three. 22% um, decrease in severity rapidly versus 40% um, in the first two weeks. Um, obviously, the higher dosages you have, the um, more uh, cyclosporin toxicity you will be exposed to. Um, okay, I didn't mention this. I was talking about um, we do use cyclosporin for... <clears throat> pediatric patients that, well, I thought I had a paper on that on here, but the big thing with cyclosporin in kids with atopic dermatitis is the development of staph sepsis. So just keep an eye on that. Um, you know, if you, they start to develop fevers and stuff like that, um, this drug is notorious um, clinically for uh, kids developing um, super infection with staph. They already have staph, but then sepsis. So just keep an eye on that. This is interesting too. Um, when you look, so eventually you want to stop cyclosporin, correct? And in atopic dermatitis, we don't have biologics. One day maybe we will, but right now we don't have biological therapy, which you know allows us to keep them on a medication for a long period. So at one point we have to stop cyclosporin. Um, the bad part of this is that the vast majority of patients within a couple months actually will relapse. The good part, though, is their severity scores are better than the baseline and when compared to pretreatment with cyclosporin. And there are some sustainable remissions. So even though they're not completely cleared and they have some relapse, overall the disease extent and severity is better. And we try to control them, obviously, with, um, with, uh, with topicals, et cetera. And, and, and you know, Celsept is also shown... Um, it's a good long-term drug as far as when compared to cyclosporin to take, have a part in therapy of these patients. So the common adverse effects, um, there are many. Um, again, in, in dermatology, again, we're using dosages that are much lower in other ailments, but we're usually in the less than 5 mg per kg per day range. However, we still do see hypertension in more than a quarter of patients altered renal functions, both acute and chronic toxicities, headaches, hypertrichosis, gingival hyperplasia, per paresthesias, and more. Um, the renal issues associated um, are, are, remember I told you I mentioned that the renal disease is, is dose-dependent. 
um, not blood pressure issues. Um, they're usually associated when it's more than five mg per kg per day and longer than two years of use. So the longer you use it, the more you use, the more likely you're going to develop um, some form of nephrotoxicity. Now, acute toxicity is reversible. Okay, and what ends up happening is you have dose-dependent afferent arterial or constriction, and you're going to see increase in creatinine levels and decrease in GFR. The importance of this is that um, it's reversible, so you actually can stop the medication; they'll be fine monitoring it. Okay, or you can lower the dosage. Okay, and if the creatinine in, is maintained or decreased and the or improved I should say and the, there's a improvement in the GFR you know that that acute toxicity is going to either reverse itself completely or is reversing so you don't necessarily have to discontinue the drug now in chronic nephropathy developed from taking cyclosporine it's progressive and this it can be associated on top of just the hypertension they do get interstitial fibrosis glomerulosclerosis vasculopathy and tubulopathy and this, again, is associated with dose and duration of treatment. And it's progressive. So how do we know? What do we look for? So they get cyclosporin, right? And you look at their baseline, and they're good. And when they come in, their serum creatinine elevates to greater than 30%. Okay, now, you still can be okay. You repeat it in a couple of weeks. If it's sustained, your two options are stop, but you don't necessarily have to stop the drug right, because this is an acute toxicity state, you just started the medication, you can actually reduce it by a gra one milligram per kg per day or more, okay, reevaluate them, right, if the creatinine goes down to baseline, the drug is still effective, you can continue the cyclosporin, however, if it remains high, greater than 30% above the baseline value, here you see, that's this box right here on the right, you have to stop the cyclosporin. If the creatinine returns within 10% of baseline, that means it was an acute toxicity, you actually can um, resume therapy, but probably at a lower dosage initially just to make sure that you don't run into that issue again, okay? Um, hypertension can be reported in up to 60% of the patients. It's reversible once the dose is reduced or um, you give them an antihypertensive. Now, remember, just on a side note, uh, this is not hypertension always from chronic renal failure. Um, if the patient has chronic progressive nephropathy from the cyclosporin, this may not be reversible. However, in most patients, this new start of the drug, without that, this is a reversible on uh, it is reversible on dose reduction or even in patients that receive calcium channel blockers, which you don't necessarily have to reduce it. You can give them a calcium channel blocker as long as that's it's not urgent hypertension. Um, yeah, it says that there. I'm sorry, I didn't. I was falling into that. And this is just basically an algorithm how to look at it. If their blood pressure systolic goes above 140 or diastolic greater than 90, repeat it two weeks later. Um, if the hypertension persists, you can add a calcium trail blocker or reduce the cyclosporin dosage by 25%, 25 to 50, but, you know, so you have two options. Um, if the patient's probably doing okay, you know, and there is a therapeutic effect, there's no harm in reducing the dosage. If they're just barely hanging on, you're going to have to add a calcium channel blocker. Basically depends on the clinical scenario you're presented with. Hypomagnesemia, common, got to keep an eye on this because they lose magnesium probably through the kidneys and lack of reabsorption, so just keep an eye on this. Um, the, there is a malignancy potential, primarily enhances um, uh, non-melanoma non, uh, skin cancers, squamous cell carcinoma, especially in patients who have previously received uh, light therapy and PUVA. So you do have to discuss that with your patient. Patient with psoriasis for years uh, who probably has received some form of light therapy and has a history of skin cancer should discuss this. This just talks about the same thing, just the increased risk in patients 
um, in five cohort studies, patients with psoriasis receiving cyclosporine shown increased risk in non-melanoma skin cancers. And those patients that have received um, sorolins and ultraviolet light even have higher risk when receiving cyclosporine. Neurologic um, headaches, tremors, seizures, psychosis, paresthesias, paresthesias um, sleep disturbances. Interestingly enough, I'm going through these. Some of these you could see in ProGraph. Um, just on a side note, the um, I won't talk about ProGraph today. Um, maybe I will add that next time to this lecture. But a lot of these you do see with tacrolimus or FK506. Um, tremor is one that I've seen before um, in patients with uh, ProGraph. But um, anyway, you just keep an eye on these. Now, whether these are specific to cyclosporin or the patient has hyponmagnesemia, um, definitely you need to make sure you look at both aspects. Is it primarily the drug? Do they have underlying um, instabilities in whatever, magnesium, potassium, et cetera? Headaches can develop in 50% of the patients. Paresthesias and tremor are not infrequent. Um, the, they usually will improve with time without even a reduction or mild reduction. Um, and this is the question I just posed, you know, is it, is it possible that these are sometimes associated with a decrease in, in magne magnesium? And probably some cases are, not all. <clears throat> so this is a question. 18-year-old kid, taking patient, kid, whatever, taking cyclosporine for, psych, uh, for psoriasis needs a new medication, right, um, for acne not for psoriasis, what drug should you avoid? So there are two of them. Anybody want to say anything on here? Make some recommendations for me. I'm calling you as a consultation. Okay, Bactrim, no. The two you need to avoid are tetracyclines. Tetracyclines associated with um, um, pseudotumor cerebri in patients receiving cyclosporine A. Okay, those are your two answers. Um, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea can occur. Transaminitis or elevated LFTs. Um, if LFTs increase greater than two to three times, two to three times. Um, decrease the cyclosporine to 25%. Um, three times you really got to keep an eye because, uh, you know, you're already pushing the limits of potential um, idiosyncratic hepatotoxicity from a drug. Um, this is just talking about cholesterol, not infrequently. These patients will uh, have elevated triglycerides. On occasion, hypercholesterolemia will be seen. This is also reversible, so check your lipids every six months. Mucocutaneous, as dermatologists, we should be experts in this, not only for our own patients, but also patients that are receiving this medication for um, immunosuppressant responses um, in, con in the context of transplantation. Hypertrichosis, epidermal cysts, keratosis pilaris, acne, folliculitis, and sebaceous hyperplasia. These are common. This one was interesting, and um, these are patients that, there's a kid who actually developed cyclosporine-induced um, nodulocystic acne, then received, uh, it's not my case, actually, this one is one of the pictures in here, it's not mine, um, but he did get isotretinoin and responded well uh, as a transplant patient. So that's one that key thing. To, I thought this was pretty impressive, actually. And then this guy comes in. He's got a kidney transplant. And he comes in and he walks into clinic. And he walks, so you walk out of clinic. And this is the exact response I got from a friend of mine when he saw this. He said, Carlos, I just saw something you've never seen in your life. And it was true. I'd never seen it. Does anybody know what this is? It's so a patient who has a transplant, as I mentioned, receiving years of cyclosporine. Don't worry if you don't know it's tough. They might be like keratosis pilaris all over, all over the body, right? KSFD. 
Lichen spinulosis, yes, exactly. Lichen spinulosis. Or I don't know what K, oh, probably follicular dystrophy, something. Yeah, there's like 30 names for this, but lichen spinulosis, induced from cyclosporin, perfect. And these patients tend to have um, <clears throat> different, uh, poorly differentiated uh, inner root sheath, follicular plugging, and hyperkeratosis, or not hyperkeratosis, perikeratosis within the hairs. It's just dystrophic hair with this thickening, as you can see. We don't see this often. Actually, we're seeing it less and less for whatever reason, but we do see it, and it's primarily done by, uh, produced from cyclosporin. Anybody know the answer to this question? What virus has been associated with this? Nope. Yes. LB. I don't know who LB is, but D, poly, uh, polyomavirus, right? So they basically were able to detect this. This was years ago, 2012. I think this was first described when I was a resident, like 2007, six or something like that, which was the prior case, which was the second report ever um, from a friend of mine. But um, basically these patients receive cyclosporin, develop this, they'll develop alopecia. It typically starts around the eyebrows. They start developing alopecia and these spicules or hair that are altered on the face, head and neck area, and even can develop leaning facies. So it should fall into your differential diagnosis of leaning facies. Um, this is just a great case that was published in the archives after this one. And it just shows here within the inner root sheath, you'll see in electron microscopy of the polyoma virus that they detected on the D. I think this is D here on the bottom right corner. Now, we do see hypertrichosis due to other drugs. Cyclosporin is a common one that we see and hear about. Streptomycin, steroids, minoxidil, um, acetazolamide, uh, phenytoin, etc., so on and so forth. The one we talk about now more frequently are the EGFR receptor inhibitors. Um, these EGFR receptor inhibitors, such as cetuximab, not infrequently are associated with uh, trichomegaly as well as hypertrichosis. Um, there are, this also causes gingival hyperplasia, not infrequently seen with many of the anti-seizure medications that we take along with cyclosporin, uh, phenytoin, phenobarbital, etc., so on and so forth. Some of the calcium channel blocking agents. Uh, more in common antibiotics, oral contraceptives, lithium, citrulline, citrulline and uh, amphetamines. Now, we don't really know exactly how this occurs in cyclosporin, although some have postulated that there's an um, stimulation of fibroblasts and inflammation within the uh, within the um, the gingiva, the mucosa. It says in, increased gingival keratinocyte proliferation. I haven't figured out how if keratinocyte proliferation is suppressed in skin. I, this doesn't make sense to me. However, they published it um, and so on and so forth. So there are various reasons. The one that's probably most studied is this increased proliferation of human gingival fibroblasts. You'll see that over and over again, as well as inflammation of the gingiva from taking cyclosporin. Vaccinations, as we said, live vaccinations are contraindicated. Pneumococcal uh, influenza vaccine should be given yearly. Um, and prior to therapy, ideally, when you first give it, immune response to hep B vaccines are impaired. And it says here, just give them before the treatment of cyclosporin and you could give it annually, no problem. Uh, we mentioned this, the pregnancy, um, it's category C, crosses placental barrier. Uh, no teratogenicity has been noted. Some low birth weights, um, it's excreted in milk. So essentially um, should not be given uh, for during breastfeeding. Now, they, they, these are the most painful uh, tables um, that I have ever been exposed to next to tables of uh, causes of allergic contact dermatitis. But um, you do have to know these for your board exams. 
Um, some you'll remember and the more common ones you'll remember. Um, these are the drugs that actually inhibit the P450 system, uh, the P450 system. So you actually have increased dosages or ser uh, serum levels of cyclosporine. Those include calcium channel blockers. And remember, we do give this drug not infrequently with, um, with, uh, with this medication. Another one that we give frequently with this medication are oral contraceptives in patients that we don't want them to get pregnant. So it's not a contraindication, but you got to monitor um, uh, toxicity levels as a result. Um, prednisone is another one that we give um, commonly in patients with atopic who may get um, cyclosporine. And statins, again, these patients get increased levels of cholesterol, and as a result, um, the, their levels may be increased if you provide them of cyclosporine may, and toxicity if you provide them a uh, statin drug. Not contraindications, but <clears throat> just red flags to note them. Um, these stimulate the P450 system, so decrease the drug concentrations. Um, anticonvulsants, rifampicin, some of these are actually, um, uh, you know, TB drugs because we may be giving, you know, these patients may be positive, however, not active. Their, C their chest x-rays are okay, and we treat them because of the, they're getting whatever immunosuppressant, and we treat them regardless with the, um, with the antibiotics for antifungals for uh, antimycobacterials, I should say, for um, tuberculosis. Um, some of these others you will also recognize. Um, some of these drugs impair renal function during cyclosporine treatment. So you have to keep an eye also, again, with uh, renal function. Those include NSAIDs, aminoglycosides, VANC, Cipro, et cetera, so on and so forth. Remember, a lot of these patients were receiving methotrexate as they are um, uh, psoriatics, may have a long history of uh, methotrexate, and may be still receiving it. Um, these drugs actually also uh, affect metabolism and increase the, uh, the levels of uh, cyclosporine, DIG, statins, prednisolone, went through some of these. Um, and then there, we mentioned this, radiotherapy, ultraviolet light, PUVA, et cetera, so forth, um, will increase long-term cumulative dosages, will increase the risk for developing, especially skin cancers. Um, that should be discussed, especially in older patients receiving this drug for long-term. And that's it. Straightforward.